All right, welcome to, um, uh, to Broadway. Welcome to Sunday School this morning. We uh, begin with uh, a few prayer requests, and I have um, several in. We're in a, a kind of a, a limited group this morning, but uh, uh, Roger is home in terms of praise and prayer. Roger's home, and he's recovering. He's doing an outpatient antibiotic treatment right now, uh, but he is on the, on the road to recovery. That's a great blessing. He was, he was struggling for a little while. Um, let's see, uh, Rob also, he had a procedure this week, uh, actually on, I think Friday, he's, uh, home and recovering, and this is going to be a little bit of a long-term recovery for him. So that's going to take a little while for him. So we want to keep him in prayer. Uh, Jeff is recovering well from his knee surgery and, and to the best of my understanding, up and walking around and, and very pleased to hear that. And then, uh, let's see, Carol, Carol's son is going to Arizona to pick up her grandson. He's been away in Arizona in college, and so they've got a long trip, so we want to keep them in, uh, in, uh, in uh, prayers for that travel. Want to rumor Rhoda, she's at home. She remains in a measure of medical care with antibiotics, but she is recovering. Uh, our brother Skip is still uh, engaged in, a, in an, a witnessing opportunity. We want to hold him and her in prayer right now. I uh, want to uh, continue to pray for the Sally family uh, as, uh, as they have suffered their loss. Remember Glenn, uh, he is still suffering an awful lot of abdominal pain right now. And lastly, I would, I would ask us to all to remember to hold our, our entire pastoral staff in prayer right now. These are very contentious times, and today is just one more expression of how contentious these times are. And would want to remember them as they do their best to provide leadership at a time when, when that is being challenged. So as we, uh, as we begin this morning, let's, let's begin in prayer. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, anything else? Any, any prayer requests or praises that we should remember right now from? No, okay. Father, we, uh, we gather in your name. We gather in a sanctuary that is a space set aside unto you. We gather as the church, Rather than begin this morning, church. let's let's and begin. We've been called here by you. We've heard your call, and we honor the the you in in our place before you as your as your servants. And we we uh, raise to you the the great praises that we have in the in thanksgiving uh, for the the help and the healing and the guidance, the counsel, the protection, the preservation that you grant, as well as a request for quite literally the same uh, for so many families in our midst. Uh, as we approach a time nationally where we give thanks, um, it let us, it guide us, it inspire us to remember to whom we give thanks and for what reason we give thanks. And this not just become a day of just family and just feast, but also a day of great thanksgiving and worship unto you for what you've done for us. We give you this time now. We offer your word back to you as we know that it is not offered unto us in vain. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, as we begin this morning, we are um, gonna continue uh, in uh, uh, Isaiah 53. We, uh, Isaiah 53 was the chapter that we were gonna focus on last week, and we, we did, but there is so much in Isaiah 53 that it was, we, it was best that we just continue today in it. Um, so as we begin today, um, uh, we always do some form of preamble. And, and it was kind of a challenge for me to, to focus in that way because the preamble that I had prepared for Isaiah 53 was all voiced last week. And now we're going to try to get back into Isaiah 53. And for if you'll open your scriptures, where we're going to begin is verse 7. We got through verses 1 through 6 last week, and we just kind of teetered into 7. And last week as we finished and we kind of just stepped into to 7, I had, had mentioned that, that in the context of 7, we want to look at three conversations. Uh, the conversation between Jesus and the trial that he was on, uh, specifically the, the trial held by Caiaphas. The conversation between Jesus and Pilate when uh, when the uh, Caiaphas sent Jesus to Pilate. And then the third conversation, the conversation between Jesus and Herod. And so uh, I am going to spend some time on that, but we just kind of teetered into to, to verse 7 as we started that last week. So to begin, though, this morning, I'd, I'd like to really begin uh, not necessarily in, 
in verse 7 of of uh, Isaiah, Jesus I'd like to back in the third up conversation, to the conversation uh, verse, between uh, Jesus chapter 16 and of Herod. Matthew, verses and so, 13 through 18. Uh, I am going to spend some time on that, uh, but we just we're familiar with this passage. This is a time to, to verse 7. Jesus was uh, last week, so uh, to I begin his attention this morning to the disciples. I'd, I'd like to really begin and ask, uh, ask the disciples, and this is this is, a, this is not in a, in a public forum. This seven, was in a fairly quiet time between Isaiah and Jesus. He says, "Who do the people say I am?" And uh, they responded back with, some say you're the Christ. Or, or I'm sorry, some say uh, that you're uh, John the Baptist. Other, and, and when they say that, they say John, they, they think of Jesus as John the Baptist uh, reincarnated because at this point, John the Baptist had already been killed by, or yeah, killed, assassinated, uh, uh, murdered as a prisoner uh, by Herod. And Herod was the, the reason that they say some people think you're John the Baptist is because Herod believed that it is possible that John the Baptist had been reincarnated into this person of Jesus and that that's why uh, uh, Jesus has drawn all this attention. And if you, that's one of the things that we would want to remember as a hallmark about the person of Herod is that he was a highly superstitious man. He was completely plagued with superstition. So some say... Uh, John the Baptist, meaning John the Baptist uh, reincarnated. Others say Elijah. The reason they would say Elijah is because uh, it is believed that Elijah, uh, uh, the voice of Elijah would be the voice that would be heralding the, uh, the coming of the Messiah. Uh, others still say Jeremiah, the, 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 the weeping prophet, the lamentuous prophet, and, or one of the other prophets. And so when, G, when they respond, what, G, what they said was is that uh, I don't know, the people have kind of a broad idea of who you may be. You could be a reincarnated John the Baptist. You could be uh, a specifically a couple of the prophets that we know specifically that, uh, that may have been engaged in the type of activity you're in and, and more just maybe one of the other prophets. Then Jesus looks pointedly at them and says, okay, that's maybe what other people say, but who do you say I am? And... The response there is, as you, as you might imagine, it's Peter that steps forward. And he says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus responds in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by the Father in heaven. And this is the, the reason that I want to bring this up this morning is because uh, what we are looking at are the, I think it's 22 or 23 hallmarks of the Messiah here. Uh, right now. And that's a part of, of what we're focused on is understanding by, um, by attribute who the Messiah is such that when we encounter the Messiah, yeah, 22, when we encounter the Messiah, we'll be able to recognize him. But none of us should, under, none of us should come to that conclusion that we, that we would understand who Jesus is of our own wit simply because we've studied what Scripture says. Jesus makes it clear that knowing who the Messiah is is something that is spiritually revealed to, to us and that when we seek the Messiah, when we seek the person of the, the, the consolation that God is providing, the, the Savior that God is providing, God reveals unto us who he is. So without splitting hairs, I would want to make sure that when we come to this and we're looking at all these attributes of the Messiah, and, I, and I'm intentionally saying Messiah, not Jesus, because at, at this time, that's all that's being revealed. The name, the person is not being revealed. It's just the attributes that are being revealed. And if we are doing what I do, what I talk about, which is make a small Messiah journal uh, and, and log these attributes, we wouldn't want to think that that's all it takes. Jesus made it clear that to know the person of the Messiah is something that's spiritually driven. And here's where Jesus continues with that particular statement. And it's, it's, it's valuable to us, I believe. He says, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Uh, there is theology that suggests that what Jesus was saying was is that that you, Peter, have stepped forward. You are the one who said, I correctly identified me as the Messiah. And as the Messiah, um, uh, I am God incarnate who has come as your Redeemer. I mean, and uh, the, the theology set, uh, that, 
the, the, there's theology that suggests that, that by that, Peter, you are the person on which the church is built. And I want to, I want to be clear here. But I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The connection is that Peter Cephas, his original name was Simon, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, renamed by Jesus Peter, or Cephas, uh, uh, Greek translation, Peter, which means rock. And so the parallel there of, of, of Peter and rock linguistically is where some will believe that it is the person of Peter that the church is built on. And that's not the case. What the church is built on, the anchor, that the, the rock that the church is built on, that, that indispensable truth by which we gather as Christians today is not the person of Peter. It is the profession of Peter that the church is built on of the fundamental indispensable statement that Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God. And I want to begin there this morning because the attributes that we're looking at right now are attributes of the Messiah. And we're going to see, once we get not to the first conversation with the uh, uh, Pharisees, I'm sorry, it is, it is in the first conversation, the first conversation with the Pharisees, when we, get, when we get to that, we're going to see how that is so important to recognize the attributes of the Messiah when we're looking for the Messiah. Okay, so let's get started uh, this morning with a little bit of, uh, of context. In 1971, there was um, a verse that was published, and I have to say that that verse has been echoing in my head all week long, and, I, and at first I didn't know why, and later on I kind of realized why that that was, that was in my head. And it was an extremely popular verse, so I want to remove the, the celebrity of the author of the verse. I want to remove that 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 really seductive rolling melody that that verse was put to and it was put to a song uh, from the verse itself and just focus on the content of the message. Now, um, as, we, as we hear that, I'm not gonna do some large expose on it. I just wanna put, put it in context here for a minute. As we do this, this verse was published in 1971 and it was lauded internationally uh, as uh, with, with two kind of primary titles. One was that this was an anthem for all ages. It was, when it was heard, it was universally loved as an anthem for all ages. And the second, which is almost, I don't know, it's just a real challenge to me personally, is, is that it was, it was called a hymn of humanity. And so that verse begins, I don't wanna, I've got it committed to memory, but I just wanna misquote it. Imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. No hell down below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people just living for today. Now we'll all recognize that verse. Uh, it may be it's easy to recognize with its melody to it, but we'll all recognize that verse. And, and our young poet friend has three verses to this song, and what he's creating is a worldview, and he's selling this worldview. Uh, when my sons were young, we would play a game uh, with television. When a commercial would come on television, we'd ask the question, what's being advertised and what's being sold? And, we'd, and, and the intent was to help my sons develop a, some sense of critical thinking, but also to be discerning. Think about what it is that's, that's happening in front of you. So maybe uh, a, uh, a car is being advertised, but power and influence is what's really being sold. Or maybe... Uh, um, a pharmaceutical is being advertised, but it's this panacea and this, this, this perfect world that you'll live in if you take this pharmaceutical that's being sold. And so there's a, there's a difference between the two. This is not new. This advertising company has been doing this for, for years. But the idea of the arts being a vehicle to communicate uh, a worldview is also not new. And this young poet is, is, is exporting this worldview that, again, was lauded as an anthem for the ages and a hymn of humanity. And in just that first verse, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell down below us and above us only blue sky. Imagine all the people just living for today. Now, I want you to hear what he's saying. What he's saying is, I want you to imagine a life that can be lived without consequence. And that's what he's saying. I, wanna, I want you to aspire to a life that you can live 
that has no consequence. The idea of no heaven and no hell and above us only blue sky and everybody living just in the moment. What he's describing is, is a life lived without consequence. So what you infer from that very easily, and quite frankly, if you read as I did what he said about his own, his own song, was that, that um, each man, and I'm going to put it in, in, in Judges, the last sentence of the last verse of the last chapter of the book of Judges. Each man living according to the dictates of his own heart. That's it. That's what I want you to imagine, and that's what I want you to aspire to. Now, our young poet will go on. He's not done. He's just laying a foundation. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. Imagine all the people just living in peace. Second thing that he wants to export for us is the idea of, of a life lived without transcendence. No nations, no borders, no religion, no identity, no heritage, no lineage. And the, the, the one that just it, it's, it's amazing that we get to imagine uh, no religion. But the one that really gets me is nothing to kill or die for. Now, I kind of get where he's going. But you've got to realize that if there's nothing to, to die for, then there's nothing to live for. There's, there's no, if, there, if, if you don't have any convictions, if you do not live with any convictions, if there's no meaning, there's no purpose, there's no transcendence, there's no, no, no belief outside of self, then there's nothing to live for and there's nothing to die for. This is a, um, if, 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 if you know this young man, he uh, uh, migrated through many, many worldviews and belief systems until he kind of settled on this amalgam of, of uh, Eastern mysticism and Buddhism. And so this vision that he's, he's developing is, is consistent with his worldview. And he'll go on with one more verse. Don't want to don't want to, uh, to belabor the point. Uh, it, it just coincident, uh, not coincidentally, but but uh, ironically, when that that the that song when it was recorded on its album was was actually cut to album. That was the third of three takes that was recorded in his private studio in his private residence at Tottingham Place, uh, in which is a ninety-two acre palatial middle 1700s, multi-million dollar estate. And if you, if you Google the, the, the Tottingham Park, what you will see is the first picture you're gonna see is the security gate going to this house. So this whole world view that this young man is trying to export for the rest of us to aspire to, he totally violates in his personal life. If, 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 you, if we don't make the connection of how influential the voice of the world can be upon us. In that same year, the film Love Story came out, sold under the title, Love Means Never Having to Say You're Sorry. 19 awards, including Oscars, the highest grossing film to date, you know, hugely successful globally. Under the byline, love never means never having to say you're sorry. It's the exact same message, that you can live a life without consequence. So how do you get there? How do you get to the point where we aspire to a life that is lived uh, without transcendence, without meaning, without purpose, without any measure of sovereignty, without a uh, 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 consequence for how we live our actual, without accountability? And I'm going to suggest to you that we craft that for ourselves. And we're not just crafting that worldview for ourselves. We're literally crafting the scales themselves that blind us when we stand face to face with truth, face to face with truth, and discard it to buy the counterfeit of our own creation. Specifically, what we've done is we've created a worldview that is um, uh, made in our own likeness and image, and that is where we get, that's what we face when we read. Verse seven of Isaiah chapter 53. He was oppressed and afflicted. And he did not open his mouth. 
who is led like a lamb to the slaughter, a sheep before her shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Verse seven, one of the, one of the, one of the kind of anchorage hallmarks of who this Messiah is. When it came time for him to, to face the accusations of who he is, he was not gonna defend himself. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of preempt and say, not only is he not gonna defend himself, but he's gonna endorse the very accusation that is made of him, and that is king of the Jews. The accusation that is brought against Jesus that seals the deal for the Pharisees, puzzles Pilate, and is di- dismissed by Herod is that you're a king, the king of the Jews. Now, why would that be such a big issue? Well, we've got to remember that Israel is, a, is a, a, an occupied territory right now. Israel uh, is under, is allowed its existence, allowed its operations, allowed its civil order and, its, and its, its nationhood right now, which is not really sovereign nationhood, it's just nationhood as a territory, because Rome allows it. Rome now controls Israel. And um, uh, uh, this... Uh, this um, this idea that there's any higher governing authority than Caesar anywhere in Rome, anywhere within Rome's control, it would be considered insurrection. And so for someone to come in and rise and say, I'm king, not good. I'm king of the Jews. I'm king over this, uh, over this city. That's considered by Rome insurrection. Well, that's not necessarily where the, the, the religious leadership of Jesus' day began. So let's take a look at those three conversations fairly briefly, but it's important to see them. Uh, first, the trial at Caiaphas's house. So uh, that's the first one. That's the first conversation. And so Jesus is arrested. We know this history. Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and I mean, if we, if we looked, oppressed, afflicted, he didn't open his mouth, he's led like a lamb to the slaughter. The idea that, that, that he was arrested and brought, led like a lamb to the slaughter, arrested and brought to, uh, into trial. Now, uh, he's brought to Caiaphas's house. So I just wanna make a really quick aside point here. Caiaphas's house is not the temple. Now, this is a trial. So there are spaces, there are uh, um, uh, hearing rooms inside the temple courts for trials. But he wasn't brought from the Garden of Gethsemane back down the hillside, through the gate, into Jerusalem, to the temple. They took a detour, and they went to Caiaphas' house. And so you might ask, well, why not the temple? Well, that's because it's not just because the temple's closed. It's after hours. It's because the temple's closed, and it's after hours. That's why. Because it is illegal in Jewish law to conduct a, a, a hearing or a legal proceeding after dark. It's, it's illegal. And what they were going to do is conduct a legal proceeding after dark. And so if they did it in the temple, one, they're breaking the law, but they're doing it in the full view of everybody else who would say, hey, there's lights on in the temple. There's candles burning. There's, a, there's lamps burning. So what's going on? And, oh, they're constructing a hearing. No, 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 no. So we're going to do this in a much more discreet way. So we're going to do it at Caiaphas's house. So Jesus is taken to Caiaphas's house. Now, you might also then ask the question, why Caiaphas's house? If you remember... Caiaphas isn't a high priest. Caiaphas is the son-in-law of the high priest. The high priest is Annas. Why are we not at Annas' house? Why are we at Caiaphas' house doing this? Well, there's a pragmatic thought, and that is Caiaphas is his high priest. This is the most high-profile trial that any of us have ever experienced, and it's, uh, if this goes awry, I need plausible deniability. I need to be able to distance myself from this, and Caiaphas takes the fall. That's a pragmatic reason. I'm going to suggest that it, that's not the reason we're not at Annas' house. We're not at Annas' house because we are literally hours from Passover at this point. Annas has already gone through uh, a week of ceremonial preparation and cleansing because he's the one that's going to have to step into the temple behind the veil into the holiest of holies and sacrifice the Passover lamb for the sins of the nation. And he cannot unseat the week-long preparations he's made to do that by being in the presence of uh, a sinner that is uh, uh, accused of being guilty of a crime worthy of capital punishment. So it's going to be at Caiaphas's house. So we're at Caiaphas's house. 
uh, and in the middle of the night in an illegal trial. Now, what happens there? Jesus, this is in Matthew, Matthew, John, and Mark, all three check in on this. There's some overlapping content, but, the, but, but they, they attempt multiple types of charges against him none of which are insurrection. They're all spiritual charges. None of them are insurrection. Uh, and they get to the point of, of asking him, uh, 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 what is, a, what is the, 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 the charge they get, I'm sorry, the charge they get to asking him is, is the charge that he claims to be the son of man, which they, they say is blasphemy, and that is the charge that they're worthy of death, but they're not permitted to kill him. They're not permitted to stone him to death. We're under Roman law. And so the, the response from Caiaphas is, is that Jesus says, it is right you say I'm a king. And Caiaphas, in a rage, says, you've heard it. You've heard it from his own mouth, the blasphemy from his own lips. So what do you think? And he poses that question to all of the rest of the, the religious leadership in the room. <clears throat> and I'm gonna suggest to you that that is where that worldview, that worldview that we started with this morning, that's where the scales begin to descend. What Caiaphas should have said is not what do you think, but what he should have asked is what do the prophets say? That's what we're studying. That's what we're looking at when we come to Isaiah. That's what God has given you. It's not that God has not asked you to think. God has asked you to think. God demands of us that we think. But think within the worldview that he has given us, within truth, within reality. There is no way that we can expect to fill our minds with the voice of the world on Tuesday and expect our hearts to be filled with the voice of God on the, on the Sabbath, or for that matter, any other day. If we are unwilling to fill our, heart, our, our minds with the voice of God, God is disinclined to fill our hearts with his voice. And this is where Caiaphas is left. He is left in a similar position as Annas. For Caiaphas, this is how it materializes. I don't even have the presence of mind to even consult what the prophets had to say about the Messiah. I've already made up my mind. This guy is guilty of blasphemy. I'm not even asking the question, what did the prophets say? This is where Annas was too. Annas is so concerned about a ceremonial preparation to face a God of his own creation that he is unwilling to stand in the presence of the God that created him the God that is, and he didn't even have the presence of mind to distinguish between the two. Now, Mark checks, or uh, John checks in on this, and what John tells us in this, in this conversation is, is that, that Caiaphas had also prophesied earlier than the year that it would be good for one man to die for the nation. Now, Caiaphas has already come to this conclusion that one man to die for the good or the welfare of the nation is already a part of what should happen this year. And from his perspective, he, remember, with the eyes veiled or shielded, from his perspective, this is great, that, that we found our man. We found our sacrificial uh, uh, offering to Rome. Uh, for the uh, uh, for the, the the unrest that's in the uh, in the city, um, and so that's what. But little did he know, and this happened elsewhere also, is that the prophecy that he was given is yes, you're right. It is. It is not only good; it is divine that the sins of of the world be borne by one man. And then I want to come to Mark. Now Mark has the most chilling account of what took place in here. <clears throat> they uh, Mark records this as uh, in the same question, tell us plainly. The, 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 they're, they're done. We've, we've been through uh, uh, accusations about what he said about the temple and tearing it down. We've been at, through accusations about the, the life that he's lived, and we're just really not getting anywhere. So it's time to drop the bomb. Tell us plainly, are you the son of the living God? And Jesus responds in Mark 14, 53 to 65, and and I want to read that just to make sure that I do not misquote it because I need you to hear it in his voice. Mark 14. Verse 
53 to 65. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the living one, the son of the blessed one? Verse 62, Christ's words, I am, Jesus said, and you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, if they had any presence of mind at all to hear what he just said, it would have chilled them to the bone. If we have presence of mind to hear what Jesus said, it should be a verification of his Messiahship. I want you to hear what he said. When asked, are you the Messiah, his response is, I am, I am your judge, and I'm coming back. Read, the, read his response again. What he's telling them is way more than they asked for. I am the son of the living God. I am the Messiah. I am your judge, and I've got some shocking news for you. I'm coming back. This is not over. End of the self-revelation of Jesus in conversation number one. Conversation number two is Pilate. Now they're done. Okay, fine. The, the, the robes are rent. He's off. We're taking him to Pilate. The charge is now insurrection. We've, we've tried on a lot of charges. We really don't have a whole lot. Uh, he says he's the king, and uh, uh, we don't know it yet, but by the time we get there in, in, the, in the, uh, the, 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 the row of the crowd, we're going to... We're going to tell Pilate point blank, we have no king but Caesar. Pilate's going to attempt to release Jesus to them, say, here is your king. And they're going to say, no, we have no king but Caesar. So we, we, we're not there yet. And, and honestly, we're not going to be focusing on that this morning. But that's the position that they've taken. So now Jesus is ushered off to Pilate. Now, <clears throat> this is in kind of two parts, but I'm not going to really uh, spend, uh, spend too much on, on the two parts. Uh, uh, Pilate, this is probably the most engaging of the conversations. This is where Jesus, in the, in the first uh, conversation, he doesn't deny. He confirms the, the charge that I am the Messiah. Okay? He, he is, any, any charge against him that was unrelated to his Messiahship, I'm not going to respond to. I'm silent. But on the charge, I am the Messiah, I'll confirm. Yes, it is as, and this is great, it is as you say. He always turns your voice back against you. It, 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 uh, uh, when uh, Pilate asked him, are you, are you a king? He says, well, is that your idea? Is that somebody else's idea they told you? <laughs> and what he's done is he's turning his voice back upon himself, your words back upon yourself. So it, we'll, you'll hear that again uh, from, uh, uh, from Jesus here. Uh, you are right in saying I am a king, and for this reason I came unto the world. Okay, so we're, we're with Pilate now. And Jesus has a, a much more engaging conversation with Pilate. Now, Pilate comes from a different platform. Pilate comes, you know, the religious leadership came from ostensibly a religious or a, or a, a, a sacred platform by which we're going to determine whether or not what claims you're made are true or whether or not you are guilty of a sin, uh, ostensibly. Now, remember, they already made up their mind. We need to get rid of Jesus. Jesus is unsetting our authority amongst the uh, people. He's causing... Uh, what is what looks like an insurrection with Rome? Rome is depending upon us to keep order in the city, and uh, and order in the city is now at a at a very fragile state because Jesus is, seems to be swaying people to believe what he believes. So we can use that against him. We can make this conversation, this accusation, to Rome that he is uh, conducting an insurrection. We can kill two, kill two birds with one stone, and we're good. <clears throat> Not where Pilate's from. Pilate really doesn't give a hoot about the religious claims that the religious leadership have uh, uh, against this uh, uh, kind of B-level zealot, as he sees him. But what he does care about is peace in the city. And the reason Pilate cares about peace in the city is Pilate's a fairly young guy. He was actually from way up in, in what is now the England area where he was born in the British Isles. And he was brought down here as a young man uh, being groomed to, to into senior leadership. And this was the big trial by fire. This was the test. You're going to go into what is one of the most unrested territories that we hold. It's also uh, fairly far out on the fringe of our control, which means we have a more difficult time dealing with it. And we're going to put you in charge of this. And, and, and here's the reason. We don't give a hoot about anything except taxes. This is a revenue generating territory. And dead people don't pay taxes. Don't kill them unless you have to. People of unrest, they don't pay taxes willingly. You need to keep them fat and happy. You need to keep civil order. 
You don't need any kind of a challenge to the authority of Rome, and you need the unquestioned authority of taxation to be first and foremost in their mind because they're generating uh, income for the emperor, for Caesar. Okay? So that's, that's the charge here, Pilate. So Pilate couldn't give a hoot about the, the religious thing. He's concerned about keeping peace. And so he comes in and he's talking to Jesus. And Jesus, he, he's, he's got some questions of Jesus, you know. Uh, but that really boils down to, uh, uh, they say you're a king. Are you a king? Is that, is that, what, we're, uh, is that what, you're, uh, what you're telling us? And Jesus said that, uh, it's, it's right that you say, I'm a king. Again, Jesus turns his words on him and verifies the claim. He's, he's, he's not defending himself against charges. He's verifying the claim that's already made against him. And then he said, and I came into the world for this reason. And anybody on the side of truth is with me. And then Pilate asked that most extraordinary question, what is truth? Now, I'm going to suggest to you that that is not a rhetorical or sarcastic question. It's a fairly noble question. Now remember that, that from Pilate's perspective, uh, uh, his position is, I've got to maintain peace and control here. But I see this huge contrast of, of how this is being worked out. And, I'm, and, and we, haven't, we haven't really uncovered this just yet, but I also live under the tutelage and control of Herod, a horribly superstitious, horribly corrupt, horribly self-entitled uh, 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 king in this territory that, that, that is just is devouring this nation for his own pleasure. And I'm looking to do my job here. So is there truth? There's what these people say. There's what these people say. There's what Rome says. There's what I have to do. Lord knows what in the world is happening with this guy named Herod. And is there truth to be found? That's where, that's where he stands. Now, Jesus will tell us, not in this passage, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father but by me. That it, it's not that Jesus knows truth, it is that Jesus is truth. The personage of Jesus is truth. So when Pilate asked this, he's looking for, for some, some peace in making a decision that he has to make. And, I, and I, this is, this is, to me, this is worth the morning. There is a huge difference between accuracy and truth. They're not the same thing. Not for Pilate as he's making his decision. Not for those who would claim that Isaiah 53 is about a season of a messianic reign rather than a person of the Messiah. That being accurate about the prophecies doesn't necessarily give you truth. That truth is what Jesus said to Peter. This wasn't revealed to you by man. This was revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. So when we live in, uh, in aspiring to the personage of truth, that is a spiritual relationship. So to answer your question, Pilate, what is truth? The person of Jesus. And in right in front of you, standing right in front of you. Pilate's position is, by, by, I don't find any charge against this guy. I don't, I don't, I don't find, I don't, I don't, I, this is part one, part two of the conversation. He goes out and he says, I don't find any charge here against this guy. Now remember, Jesus, this is all in the context of Jesus as the Messiah standing silent before his accusers. I verified what you said. You said I'm king. I said it is right that you said I'm king. I am told the, the religious leadership, I am your, I, I, I am the son of God, I am your judge, and I'm coming back. Now Pilate's in a quandary. Pilate doesn't have an answer, so he's going to send Jesus on to Herod. Herod's going to get it. Now, just in a nutshell, uh, this, is a, this is a very short account with Herod. Uh, we have only Luke records this in chapter 23, and it's a very short account. And we know that Herod had longed to see Jesus because he thought that it would be kind of interesting if Jesus would perform some type of, of something supernatural for him. And so, uh, so he finally has Jesus in his court, and he wants to see something supernatural. So Herod uh, offers a couple questions and, and asks him for this miracle. Jesus says nothing, does nothing. He gives Herod nothing. This is important because Herod is the kind of the culmination of the, I refuse to accept what God says 
who the Messiah is, and I'm more concerned about what I think about what the Messiah is in the house of Caiaphas, to who the Messiah is is really not important spiritually. It's only order. Can't we all just get along is important to Caiaphas or to, uh, uh, to Pilate, to now we're to Herod. The, the, the most, the most fringe-like response. Come on, Jesus. They say you're, you're the Messiah. You're the miracle worker. You're this, this son of God. Do for me, a, do for me a, a one of those miracles I, 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 that I hear about. And Jesus offered him nothing. I'm going to say that Jesus' silence, because and, and, literally there was no engagement at all with Herod. Jesus' silence is an appellate scream. You... Herod, in this worldview that you have, is so far from reality that you have no capacity to distinguish between a magic trick and a miracle. No matter what I would do here, no matter what miracle I would offer, no matter what display, no matter what proof of divinity, you would only see a magic trick. Now, if you struggle with that thought, that's exactly what happened in the courts of Pharaoh when Moses walked in there, that there were three signs that God gave, uh, miraculous signs that God gave Moses. And when he did the first two, the magicians duplicated them. It's pretty remarkable that they could duplicate those through illusion, but they duplicated. But the third one, they couldn't duplicate. The, 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 what Pharaoh said was the same thing that was going on in Herod's head, is that, hey, that's a pretty good trick you got there, Moses. Uh, 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 Ephraim, come here. Can you, can you do that? And they did it. And so there was a one-up. said, oh, look at that. That's really cool. Hey, can you guys do that? And they did it again. See, the, 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 the mindset that, 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 that discernment is out the wind, out the window, is what governs here at three different levels in this life. And Jesus is confronting all of this or sequentially, and, and this, is, this is important. First, and because we're about to move on from this, first to the Jew, remember the model, for, I reveal myself first to the Jew and second to the Gentile. That's what he's done. I came to my own, to my own knew me not. Now I come to the Gentile world to reveal myself. Now let's, let's, let us, let's move on here because we need, to, we need to, 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 to look at the rest of what's being said here in this, uh, in this chapter. Now we're going to move to the, if, 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 if our young poet friend wants to describe a life without consequence, uh, uh, then here's the consequence of the decisions that are made. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? The, 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 the very, if you're keeping a Messiah journal, the very brief little notation that you might want to uh, enter here is, is that, that um, there are no bloodline descendants of the Messiah. If you're looking at someone who, gave, who fathered a child, then you're, then, you're, then you're looking at the wrong person. There are no descendants of the Messiah. But now let's move on here. For he was cut off from the land of the living, and, and for transgression of my people was he was stricken. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to grab a group here, and then I'm going to come back. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people, and he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet the Lord's, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days for he, uh, he uh, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After the suffering of the soul, he will see the light of light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and uh, will bear their iniquities. And I want to stop there. This is, if you, if you follow this sequence, it's kind of like, uh, 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 are you the son of man? Uh, yeah, I'm, I am. Uh, I'm your judge and I'm, your, I'm coming back. This, a similar sequence is here uh, in this. This is the, the death the burial, and the resurrection. This is, though we are headed into Christmas, and Christmas is lauded by most calendars as the, the kind of the happiest time of year, the joyous time of year. Uh, in the Christian calendar, the birth is indispensable, but the resurrection is the proof. What we celebrate at the season of the resurrection 
That's the confirmation. If we're, if, we're, if we're checking off things in our Messiah journal, but we're not yet convinced yet, that's, where, that's the, the point at which we become convinced. That we were looking for a man who will die, who will be buried, and who will resurrect from death. That's what we're looking for. Not the contemporary theology of the swoon theory. Well, he didn't really die. He was just in a kind of a coma thing, and then he woke up in the tomb. Uh, not uh, the, the stolen body answer. Oh, yeah, sure, he died and he was buried, but he didn't resurrect. That's a part of it. That's just a myth. Don't, don't, don't buy into that idea that he resurrected. The, the disciples had to, to steal his body in order to make it look like he was resurrected. No, no. if you're looking for the Messiah and you're making out your Messiah journal, what you're going to write down is that the Messiah will die, he will be buried, and he will resurrect in life. And if we, if we go, uh, it, it is, it's in 1 John, and I believe it is in chapter 3. And it says that, that we will know, we will know who he is. Gosh. Uh, this will only take me a second here. I don't want to misquote this because this is, this is, this is part and parcel to what is so important that we're talking about right now. Yeah, it's 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. This is how we can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Yeah. This is how we can recognize the Spirit of God. This is how we will recognize those amongst us. This is how you will discern the difference between a born-again believer, a redeemed, and a congregate. Now, it's, e- it's much, much easier to distinguish between the redeemed and the unredeemed on the outside of these walls, but sometimes it's a lot more difficult to distinguish between the redeemed and the congregate inside these walls. But this is how you're going to know that it is the Spirit of God within them that you will see. This is how you will recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That's the, that's the key, in the flesh. Jesus resurrected in the flesh. That's the distinction that John's making. If you read 1 John, you will see that John doesn't allow you to, to write the terms, he doesn't allow you to define the terms, and he doesn't allow you to do use the terms. He writes the terms. It, it's expressed, this is how we know. Then he defines the terms by giving you what you know, how you know. And then he uses the terms. He applies them in a sequential manner. This is almost at the end of a sequence in 1 John. But this is how you know that he arose in the flesh. That's what the prophecy says, that he arose in the flesh. Not, not, not arose in the spirit, didn't come back in the spirit, but he, he rose in the flesh. That's what you're looking for. So, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of many, the people, uh, uh, he was stricken. Yeah, just to, to make sure, yeah, we're getting there. We're going to we're gonna have to wrap up here fairly quick. For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of many people. He was stricken in his house. You know, he was not executed. He was not sentenced to a death punishment. Unlike what the Pharisees wanted in Caiaphas' house, unlike what Pilate attempted to prevent, and unlike what Herod couldn't give a hoot about, Jesus was not executed. Jesus submitted himself to the form of execution of Rome, but he gave up his life, willingly uh, gave himself to the cross, and then uh, not through bodily failure, but through his will, released his spirit on the cross. And that brought death into the body. By oppression judgment, he was to, uh, for he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of many people, he was stricken. He did this. He, and, and the why is important. Why was he cut off from the land of the living? For the transgressions of many people. Not because his heart stopped. Not because Rome nailed him to a cross. Not because there was a spear thrust into his side. Not because he suffered a beating that would have killed almost anybody else, if not anybody else. No. His life was given, not taken, for this reason. The transgressions of many. Our sins. Our sins were laid upon him. He was assigned a grave 
with the wicked and with the rich in his death. And though he had done no violence, no deceit was in his mouth. Uh, uh, it suggests that, that this is the burial. This is the burial. The, the death happens on the cross. This is the burial. And it is a common burial. This is not any burial of a martyr that was full of pomp and circumstance. This was no uh, 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 discard of a, of a body in the, uh, in the trash heap. It was just a common burial. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. He will see his offspring prolong. He will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Now, there's two parts to, to, to this package of, 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 uh, of that particular verse. First, and this is, I think, this, it's hard for me. I don't know, maybe I'm alone in this, but it's hard for me to, to, to reconcile um, that it was the Lord's will to crush him. It was the Lord's will that this suffering happened. Not just the death on the cross, but the suffering. I had a, had a fantastic... A uh, conversation on Tuesday morning with a brother that I study with every every Tuesday morning, Brad and and Brad and I were discussing uh, uh, the the content that we discussed last week, and and um, uh, and without going into any kind of real detail, Brad invested huge amounts into me uh, in that discussion about about the breadth of what that that death looks like what that suffering looks like, both the anguish, the mental anguish of having been rejected by the very people I created and the physical anguish of the beating, or the physical suffering of the beating and then the anguish upon the cross, that you, you, can't, you can't petition those. And, and, and Brad was so very, very right on that. And all of that we have to accept, whether we like it or not, which is difficult for me to accept, but I do. That was all God's will. That was his specific and prescriptive will that when that cross was employed by the Roman authorities to be the tool on which my son will, will hang and at the point at which he will give up his life, it will be done at the end of immeasurable anguish, at the beginning of a descent into the belly of the earth to release the captives, and for you for you. That was God's will that this happened in this way for you. Again, Messiah Journal, this is being done for me. He's, that this death that we're going to see and this burial of a, of a, of a body is going to happen for me. The second part of this is that um, he'll see his offspring and prolong his days. Well, we had read early on that uh, uh, he, uh, uh, who, can, who can speak of his offspring. The offspring that we're talking about is what we were talking about early on uh, with this claim of who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? You're the, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. How do you know that? Nah, it's not by, by men. It's by, by the spirit of God within you that you know that. Who are my brothers and sisters? Jesus, come on, buddy. You're, you're, I know you're in, the, you're in this house, and, and he says, but there's a huge crowd here, and mom says that we're pretty certain that, that you're not necessarily balanced. And so Jesus' brothers and sisters come and try to get him out of the house where the man has just been lowered through the roof to be healed by his three friends. And Jesus says, who are my brothers and sisters? Here. These are my brothers and sisters. What he's saying is, is that the family of God is not a bloodline, it's a faith line. The people that are assembled in this room right now who are witnessing this miracle healing of this young, they're here because they believe I am who I say I am. And it's really hard to hear that his mom and his, his, the, the, the uh, other children that Mary bore are outside, uncertain as to whether or not he is of sound mind. And yet inside this house are a group of people that he says, here's my true brothers and sisters. Who is my mother? Who are my brother? Who are my son? These, the believe, people who believe, people who have placed their faith in me for who I say I am. So when we read, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. That's what he's talking about. You are who he's talking about. You are the offspring. You are the family of God. You are the redeemed. You are the ones that the propitiation of the cross bore. 
Your rebirth into the family of God is what he's talking about. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge or truth. My righteous servant will justify many. Now, we're we're going to close with this. We, we need to close here this morning. <clears throat> we close with the resurrection. We, we open in verse 8 and we close in verse 11 with the resurrection. The resurrection. Again, if you got your Messiah journal out, you're looking for a, a, a death, a burial, and a resurrection. There's a sequence that unless you can identify that in the person you're considering as the Messiah, you got the wrong guy. That's what you're focusing on. This is the prophecy. So we're gonna clo- we need to close here. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go long if we're if we're if we're not careful here. Um, the the question that Caiaphas asked, what do you think? Is the wrong question. If we are not careful, we don't end up with the right answers because we don't ask the right questions. We start inventing a world for ourselves like John Lennon. And we try to aspire to a counterfeit. And we try to sell that off to other people. Enormously successfully, that was sold off as a, if you can believe it, a hymn of humanity. Even borrowing from the Christian language, a hymn, a hymn of humanity. And the scales of blindness descend upon a lost and dying world because they don't even have the presence of mind to ask the right questions. That's what leads you to Caiaphas' house to say, ah, what do you think? Without the presence of mind to say, what did the prophets say? If the question on the table is, is this guy is who he says he is or not, then it really doesn't make too much difference what our opinion is. The most important thing to know is, what do the prophets say? And does this man on trial in front of us meet that criteria? Not even the presence of mind. Worst case scenario, we're sitting at the, at, at, uh, at the point at which the delusion of buying the voice of the world, filling our, our, our minds with the voice of the world and totally deaf to the voice of God in our hearts is, is Herod, the one who has an even the presence of mind to distinguish between the magical and the miraculous. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the world that we step into every single day. That is the world that is lost and dying apart from the Messiah. And unless we commit ourselves not to the Messiah that we want, that meek and mild Jesus, that milk toast Jesus, that Jesus that makes me happy, that little baby Jesus in the the manger, that's the one that I like to see. I I, I don't like to see Jesus on the cross. I like to see that little baby in in the manger. Unless we are willing to receive the Jesus that is, the Jesus that reveals himself, then we've just made another idol. And we are in in deep danger of arriving where Herod was. And that's where the world is. And that is what God has vested into us, the truth, in order to minister to. We've got to close this morning. Uh, uh, Next week will be our last week in Isaiah. So we'll just take the last chapter of this particular book. So... Uh, whatever that is. That is um, um, yeah, Isaiah 65. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, just do, we'll, we'll take next week Isaiah 65. Uh, and then we'll be moving on in the next quarter for in Luke. So, Father, we thank you for the blessing of the assembly uh, in your name, the opportunity to assemble in your name. We thank you that you have told us ahead of time uh, who you are, such that when we see, we would know. Uh, you've spoke this over and over to your disciples. This I tell you ahead of time, so when it happens, you will remember. You have given us awareness, Father, uh, both pragmatically and spiritually, to recognize you for who you are. Be upon our hearts. Guide us. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.